What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, your home for the 2020 World Series champion, Los Angeles Dodgers. My name is Jeff Spiegel, back from vacation myself. Daniel Starkin is on vacation, Matt Moreno filling in. And Matt, it, it, what a crazy week. I mean, five games in seven days, but it feels like an eternity has happened in the last eight or nine days. How are you feeling about the Dodgers at this moment? Oh man, still, I guess a little, a little of the same of what it's been, honestly, the past few weeks, just because, and I know we're going to get into this in the show, like the injuries just don't seem to stop, whether minor or major. And, you know, that's a little concerning because it's, it's been, you know, the Dodgers will be fine if they get healthy, but that if just hasn't really happened yet. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get into that. I'm just not sure if it's ever going to come. I, I did feel like following along on social media while I was gone, there, there does seem to be more and more of a sense of Dodger fans resigning them to themselves to the fact that the wild card game is really in play. There are four games out in the division. I guess I'll phrase you one more question this way before we get into some of the more specific stuff. But are you in that camp? Like, have you started to shift expectations away from the most likely scenario is winning the division to the most likely scenario now is playing in that wild card game? I think so. And I, and I'll kind of handicap that as it, it could be marginal in like 51, 49 type thing. You know, it, four games certainly is not insurmountable. If we get to the start of September and it's still four games, then, you know, yes, I think at that point you're a lot more likely looking at the wild card game. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's it's close, but I am definitely leaning a little bit more towards that just because everything seems to be going the Giants' way. Yeah, yeah. We've got that Milwaukee game the other night where the guy basically drops a fly ball that would have ended the game. The Giants go on to win. Giants have won seven of their last ten. Again, the Dodgers are four games back despite having a winning percentage of 600. I mean, still one of the best teams in all of baseball. But that's the funny thing is the Giants' season is what kind of is framing the perception, I think, for Dodger fans where yeah. – if the Giants were just having a normal season and the Dodgers are three and a half up on the Padres winning 60% of their games, everyone would be happy-go-lucky right now. Instead, the Giants can't seem to lose. The Dodgers sort of limping through some of these stretches, and uh, we're running out of time. I mean, 67 and 45, so 50 games left in the season at this point. So quick recap from last week. Dodgers, like I said, a couple off days, only five games this week. They go 3-2, and 3-0 two. Three loss to the Astros. On Tuesday, they muster just five hits. They waste a gem from Walker Bueller. They come back on Wednesday, thankfully, with a 7-5 win over the Astros. That's Max Scherzer's debut. Gives up a run in the first. The Dodgers get seven runs in the first three. He finishes with seven innings, two earned runs, 10 strikeouts there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Another off day on Thursday. Then we get a Friday, Saturday, Sunday set against the Angels. And if we're being honest, that was a pretty pathetic Angels roster most of the weekend. They lose in extra innings on Friday, 4-3. to three. David Price, pretty solid start from him. Clevenger and Gratterall end up blowing that. Um, and then they come back, thankfully, and they win Saturday and Sunday, 5-3 to three and 8-2. to two. Saturday, Trey Turner's debut. Cody Bellinger, a pair of home runs on Saturday and Sunday. Bueller, a great start. So kind of a, a positive way to end the, to, the, to end the weekend, I should say. So let's get into some of the headlines from that past week. And I think it has to start with Max Scherzer and Trey Turner. Obviously, the move was done uh, more than a week ago, but we didn't get to see these guys until Wednesday in Scherzer's case. Saturday and Trey Turner's case. So let's start with Scherzer. Seven innings pitched, five hits, two earned, one walk, 10 strikeouts. I mean, just vintage Scherzer. This is exactly what you hope for. He has so few starts that when he comes through, it's huge. What did you make of Scherzer's debut on Wednesday? It was sort of basically as advertised. I mean, you, you know, obviously, what kind of competitor he is. Um, his resume and history, history and success speaks for itself. He's been in the postseason, won a World Series. Um, I think what made it interesting to me is there was going to be excitement with no matter what start, whenever Scherzer made his first yeah. start for the Dodgers, right? And then you layer in on top of the fact that it came against the Astros. Um, he obviously doesn't have the same, you know, resentment as maybe some of the Dodgers players and definitely the fans do. But he said, like, I can recognize, you know, what this means kind of to the team and the fans. And I think he embraced that. And he said after the game, you know, he fed off the crowd's energy. Um, it, he also said it was his first curtain call that he received, which hearing that struck me as really odd considering everything he's accomplished. Uh, we tweeted out those quotes, and we had a lot of replies from Nationals fans saying it wasn't necessarily true. I think there's some semantics at play <laughs> with a curtain call and a standing ovation yeah. after you know a complete game type thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you can't say enough about what he's done. And now he's starting, uh, I believe, tomorrow against Aaron Nola and the Phillies, and so he's got another you know important 
game on deck. Yeah, and it did feel like we're going to talk a little bit about Mookie Betts talking about the atmosphere. You were there for those Astros games. Um, to lose 3 to nothing on Tuesday with all of the emotion and to come back, I mean, you never want to over-exaggerate kind of the importance of a regular season game, but that one felt significant. Obviously, the race with the Giants makes it significant, but the fact that you only get these two games against the Astros at home, the fact that they had lost the first one 3 to nothing pretty remarkable for him to do what he did especially he gives up one run in the first inning and then thankfully again the Dodger offense but he settles in he ends up going seven innings again the 10 strikeouts gets to double digits there free jumbo jacks by Max Scherzer all by himself but I mean again like it's fascinating when you trade for a guy like Scherzer because you can count the number of starts that he's going to make right like you're you're only going to get let's say 10 starts from the guy and so you you need all of those to count when you factor in the cost the prospect cost Josiah Gray has looked really good, so happy for him in Washington. Uh, but, I mean, man, for Scherzer to come out in, in such a big moment, in such a big game, and do that, I think it just gives you confidence knowing, okay, if we have to go to the wild card game, we've got Bueller, we've got Scherzer. We feel good about that. Beyond that, we'll talk injuries in a moment. Beyond that, who the heck knows? <laughs> um, but at least that. So let's flip to Trey Turner, who, in some ways, you could argue, actually had a more impressive first week as a Dodger. Um is that a fair statement, do you think? I mean, as good as Scherzer was, I feel like the buzz around Trey Turner on Saturday and Sunday is almost like overflowing with just how excited people are about what they've seen from Turner. Yeah, I think it's a little it's only unfair in the sense of like you said, with a with a starting pitcher, it's yeah. one game every, you know, four, five, six days, whatever the case may be. Whereas with a position player, especially somebody like Trey Turner, who's playing every day and also batting leadoff and we'll get into the lineups later. Uh there's more opportunities for him to make an impact. I think with with Trey Turner, it's been more of like a an off yeah. factor, right? Like watching him play for the Nationals, you would see him occasionally when the Dodgers would play them, you know, the two series against them every year, and then if they met in the postseason, and so you had a sense of what he's capable of doing. But seeing it now, you know, for the Dodgers, watching it kind of in person, it it changes things. And so I think Trey Turner definitely had more of an off factor. Uh, and that's not to obviously demean anything yeah. Scherzer did, because like you said, they that was a big game. And, you know, every game at this point, frankly, for the Dodgers is big. They essentially need to play 600 to 700 baseball the rest of the way. And so, you know, every win that they pick up is going to be. Yeah, and with Turner, what I love is sort of the versatility that you get in the sense that he impacts the game in so many different ways. I think yeah. you, you see if you've seen teams steal against the Dodgers and put pressure on them on the on the base pass with speed. And it's easy in my head, I think, for me to discount how important that really is and how much that really impacts it. But when you have a guy like Turner on your team, and first of all, the pitcher's throwing over there five or six times because he's worried about him. And second of all, when he's stealing bases with such ease, he's scoring from first, he's scoring from second. The way he moves around, I think the speed. I love this from Fabian Ardaya at The Athletic. This was a quote from his piece just yesterday, I believe. He said, take his first start on Saturday when he let off the game with a walk and scored from first on the fastest sprint speed of the Dodgers season, 30.6 feet per second, after Muncy's double. When Turner got on later in the game with the single, he quickly stole second and put himself in a position for a red-hot bets to drive him in. Turner then led off Sunday with a double, scored easily without a throw on a Muncy grounded single that was fielded in shallow left. The next inning, he broke for second and scored all the way from first on an A.J. Pollock chopper that barely left the infield. So you kind of put all these pieces together. You can see the pressure he puts on. You can see there's just an energy. I think that's the word that sums him up to me. Yeah. There's an energy. We talked about, do you put him? Do you put Mookie at the top of the lineup? I can't imagine moving Turner because the energy he brings, just when he is on base, knowing that the pitcher's worried about him, knowing that a steal is always in play, knowing that he can score from first on any double, that he can score from second on any single, um, I think they said he's like one of the fastest, he's the fastest player, or tied for the fastest player in baseball. He's third in steals. So um, all of that. And then on top of it, unbelievable defense at second base. I think it was Saturday's game where he made two or three plays that were huge moments in the game. Um, and we haven't even seen the power that we know is really there with Trey Turner. Yeah. And, you know, another thing, too, with the threat of his speed is it also changes uh the pitches that now, you yep. know, Max Muncy might get more fastball. You can't throw, if you throw him a curveball, you're going to, Trey Turner's going to steal second base yeah. easily. I mean, he'll, he'll get in there standing up. So just the pitch selection, everything changes. And, you know, he might have even uh, inspired A.J. Pollock and Justin Turner because they pulled off a double steal uh, yesterday as well, which I can't remember the last time the Dodgers did that with somebody like A.J. Pollock stealing third base as the lead yeah. runner. Yeah, well, and so all of this, Trey Turner's been amazing. He's under contract a year from now. 
I think one positive you have to say about the guy also is his willingness to play second base. We know he's a shortstop. And I don't mean this as disrespect to Corey Seager, but Corey Seager has been hesitant, let's say, to move off of shortstop, uninterested in moving off of shortstop. So for Turner to come in and say, hey, I'll play second base, you know, I'll play the outfield wherever you need me, I think is speaks highly of him. I think the thing most Dodger fans are starting to put together in their head is like, is Trey Turner the long-term shortstop of the Dodgers? Is, is Corey Seager, you know, how do you, where do you, I mean, it's two games in. The flip side of this is it's not like we're judging this up two years. Like Trey Turner has been one of the three or four best players in all of baseball, you could make an argument, over the last four or five years. He rates out higher than Corey Seager in just about every metric over the past four years. The difference defensively, for sure, um, wins above replacement, etc. So where do you stand? Is Trey Turner an insurance policy in case Corey Seager sort of gets an unreasonable offer from somewhere else? Is Trey Turner the succession plan and the Dodgers don't end up making a serious offer to Corey Seager? How do you see this situation playing out? And where do you personally stand on how you would navigate it? It's tough. I mean, I I see to answer your question, it's basically yes to both of those. Um, I think the Dodgers are going to be willing to make Seager a competitive contract offer. Uh, But like we've talked about on this show before, all it takes is one team to come in and say, you know, here's our offer. We're going to blow everybody else out of the water. And that will change the complexion, especially now from the Dodgers standpoint. They don't really get into bidding wars yeah. anyway. And if they know they have Trey Turner for an, at least another year, they're they're not going to do that with Seager. Um, on a personal level, I would like to just resign <laughs> yeah. both of them. Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, it's easier said than done. And you know, with the DH presumably coming to the National League starting next season, you know, maybe Seager does move to third base if uh, Justin Turner shifts to more of a DH role potentially. Yeah. Um, I, there's just way too many moving pieces. I, it, it's tough because I think Corey Seager, when he's healthy and Corey Seager, he's one of the best shortstops in baseball. I mean, we saw it, you know, in the playoffs last year. Yeah. And Trey Turner, Trey Turner, obviously his talent speaks for itself. And what's fascinating, I think, is they're yeah, different. Completely. I think Trey Turner can, can, you could argue he impacts the game more ways than Corey Seager yeah. does. Does that make him a better player? I mean, it's you know almost a matter of preference. Yeah, and I think it's hard for Dodger fans. We will never forget what Corey Seager did on the way to the World Series last year. I mean, clearly the best player that the Dodgers had throughout the postseason. And they win the World Series. So that deserves some credit, obviously. I'll be so fascinated to see two things. One, does Corey Seager ever open up to the possibility of playing third base? And secondly, how committed is Trey Turner long-term to wanting to be a shortstop? Because I wonder if the Dodgers, I mean, Gavin Lux has struggled. Um, I think they hoped he was the long-term option at second base or shortstop. I think there's still optimism there, but it's it's diminished a little bit. And so if Trey Turner says, hey, you know what? I, I like L.A. I'd like to be here long-term. He claims he was open to being, you know, we don't need to get into what happened between him and the Nationals. He claims he was open to a contract extension that never came. So would he be willing to play second base and say, hey, I'll sign a long-term extension here, even without a guarantee that I'm going to be playing shortstop, because if that's the case, that makes it easy. Is Corey Seager finally, for the first time, seemingly open to becoming the Dodgers' third baseman of the future? As you point out, Justin Turner um, sort of becomes a DH, because that makes things easy. Or if you have to choose between Corey Seager and Trey Turner, that becomes a really fascinating moment and a fascinating conversation. And the Dodgers have to play this wisely, because if, if Seager leaves, then all of a sudden... Trey Turner, the leverage that he has is through the roof because he'll be coming a free agent in a year in which the number of shortstops on the market is far less, right? But right now, the Dodgers, if Seager were to leave, they could go after Trevor Story or some of these other guys who are free agents. Whereas if they wait until Turner's done and don't reach an extension with him and don't re-sign him, then you're kind of left with with no real option, it seems like. Now things change, but I, I personally am surprised, and I'm trying not to overreact to two games where I've actually watched Trey Turner closely and inten- more intensely than in the past. He's a guy I've tracked, obviously. You play fantasy baseball, like you know who Trey Turner is. But I, I just really like what I see. And again, even if you just look from a metrics perspective, he's been more valuable than Corey Seager. Now, some of that's helped, but that has to be factored in. He has accumulated more wins above replacement. He's better defensively. And so I think there's a part of me that leans Trey Turner over Corey Seager if I had to choose. If you said you get one of these guys for the next seven years, there's a part of me, and it hurts to say because I love Corey Seager, I think there's a part of me that leans Trey Turner. Where do you stand on that one? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if it if it all boils down to that, I, I'd agree with you. I think just his health um, is 
production. You know, it's fortunately it wouldn't be a bad necessarily be a bad decision either yeah. way. But if you the smarter decision, the safer decision, if you will, would probably be tricky. Yeah, and we'll see. We'll see what the Dodgers do um, and how it all plays out. I mean, and it's not to say that he has been the pick, perfect picture of health. Um, obviously, he's had a couple of years where he he's missed some extended time. But Corey Seager, you know, has been one of the the most injured Dodger players over the last few years, which is the perfect transition into our next headline here, Daniel, Smooth. Matthew, which is injuries. The Dodgers' injuries, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. We'll start with the biggest one, Clayton Kershaw. Um, there was a report on August 4th that Clayton Kershaw had, had kind of had warmed up but then was back to not playing catch. Um, and then it came out later in the week that he's still sore. The scans are clean, which is good, but now the expectation is he will not be back until September. Here's a quote from Kershaw. Basically, I just tried to come back too fast, which is a bummer. After the Sim game, it didn't really respond well. It's frustrating. It's still nothing serious, but it's just something that's going to take a little bit of time. It's no fun. Being hurt is miserable. I really don't enjoy it at all, especially with what's going on here. The guys we have coming in, the stretch run, I want to be a part of it so bad. I'm going to do everything I can to be back. I think I will be, but definitely looking more like September than August. I know we're still going to be in the middle of it, so I'm excited excited to be a part of it then. He was followed up question about rehab. He said, I didn't do it very well last time. I was probably a little too impatient with my rehab. That's on me. I just want to be back. I wanted to pitch. This time it's a little different because we're up against the calendar. So there's only so much you can rest before you go. We're going to rest as long as we can to give myself a good chance to pitch in September. Pitch some meaningful games in September and be ready to go in October. Um, This is a big deal in part because it's Clayton Kershaw and in part because Tony Gonsolin is also shut down and not throwing right now. Not sure when he'll start throwing. So at best, he sounds like he's on the same timeline as Clayton Kershaw. Maybe worse. What the Dodgers, as soon as you think they have the starting pitching rotation figured out, it all falls apart again. So, what do you make of Clayton Kershaw? And, and I guess, how optimistic are you about the impact he'll be able to have and when he might be coming back? Yeah, this is tough. I mean, I, you know, you know me, I don't try to come on here with a ton of negativity or pessimism, but honestly, like his comments and just the whole situation is alarming. Yeah. Um, he, he has always been open, he doesn't like, be, nobody likes being hurt. He, definitely despises it and you know in the past has also admitted to you know maybe he tried to be a little bit too aggressive with his rehab so that wasn't necessarily surprising what concerns me and like the quote you just read and when he was when he was doing that uh zoom call with the media was he also said there's only so much i can rest because we're up against the calendar which maybe i'm reading too much into it but sort of implies like i need more time than we have and so I'm just going to get as much time as I can buy right now. And then what it's, it is what it is. It's going to be maybe painful, maybe some discomfort that I have to pitch through for the rest of the year. That's concerning. What I try to hold on to is that him and the Dodgers keep saying that the scans, whether, you know, I'm assuming it was an MRI, uh, keeps coming yeah. back clean. Um, but it, it, there is definitely cause for concern there. And so, you know, if you're looking at September, I mean, it all depends on when he can start playing catch. Yeah. Uh, a month, if he is able to start early September, I think a month's worth of starts uh, is enough for him to find a rhythm um, for you know the postseason that obviously the Dodgers hope ends with a an NLDS appearance, whether it's because they won the division or the wild yeah. card game. Because I mean, if it, obviously doom and gloom scenario, we could get to a scenario where Clayton Kershaw doesn't pitch a game in October. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we'll see. It's concerning to say that. Yeah, least. I'm with you. I, I actually interpreted it the same way, where it's kind of like, in an ideal scenario, I'd be out longer, but we don't have that time, so we're just going to go for it. And the flip side is, look, it's Kershaw. He's a veteran. He knows his body. He knows what's going on. Obviously, he rushed it, but it's kind of like, if anybody can make the best out of situations, it's him. The flip side is, yeah, we're not talking about like, hey, we need one or two starts in October. We're talking about like, we need five or six starts, because we're hoping for the NLDS and then the NLCS and then the World Series. And we're probably going to need five starts at least from you in that stretch. Who knows? Um, and obviously the pressure is less because of Scherzer and because of Bueller, even Urias, who's still healthy. But again, he's a guy who has blown past his career high in innings. And so who knows what we're going to get if he has to make 10 more starts plus five or six more. Um, so it's, I think, alarming. I think concerning. Those are the right words. Um, now, who knows? If he can make five starts in September before the playoffs, then maybe we all change our tune and feel a little bit better. But again, part of the other factor here is the Dodgers are chasing the Giants. The Dodgers are not trying to maintain a division lead. They're trying to chase down the team ahead of them. And so it's not one of these years where it's like, hey, just rest guys, get healthy. It's like, 
we're facing up against the wild card game, and that can't that can't be an option. Like that can't be a realistic option because in one game we've seen it. We've seen what can happen, the randomness that can happen in one game. The Dodgers lose four to three in extra innings to a terrible Angels team on Friday. Like one game against the Padres would be far more difficult and challenging than that, especially in a one game scenario where it's like you might be deeper than them, you might have more you know talent overall, but if they have one starting pitcher who throws a gem. And then a closer who's good, I mean, anything could happen. So the Kershaw piece, definitely concerning, definitely alarming. And, and it's not the only one, which I think just adds fuel to the fire. As I mentioned, Tony Gonsolin is shut down. He's not sure when he'll start throwing again. Victor Gonzalez has knee inflammation. He's on the injured list. Clevenger has an oblique strain. He's on the injured list. Jimmy Nelson done for the year with Tommy John surgery. So that might be a career ender for him, which is terrible for Nelson, who was turning into a really solid bullpen piece for the Dodgers. Those are the guys on the injured list. We're going to talk in a moment about the guys who are almost on the injured list, but aren't yet. But I mean, this is where it starts to stack up. Gonzalez, Clevenger, Nelson. Those are three guys that, you know, Gonzalez and Nelson for sure would have been in the Dodgers bullpen at full strength. Clevenger, I think you can make an argument. So, I mean, it just feels like Gonsolin too, you need the starting pitching. He's out. It just feels like everything's coming to a head for the Dodgers specifically. Yeah, you know, if we, we go back to the beginning of the season, you're looking at the starting rotation and the pitching staff, and you're wondering, you know, where are all these guys going to fit in? There are too many pitchers. Yeah. And now the Dodgers, I mean, they've called up guys that, you know, you've never really heard of because they've needed yeah. innings, basically. The bullpen's just been taxed. The rotation has dealt with injuries. Um, I, you know, Victor Gonzalez, the, Victor Gonzalez and Jimmy Nelson injuries are hurt, especially Nelson in particular, because like you said, they were established. Nelson more so than Gonzalez uh, was probably going to play, you know, continue to fill a high yeah. leverage role, just a valuable option moving forward. Vic, with Gonzalez, you were hoping he would eventually find, <laughs> you know, some of his success from last yeah. year. I guess, you know, Dave Roberts did say he's not sure how long he's really been pitching with the knee issue. It's his right knee, so it's his landing knee. I imagine that affected performance, so maybe that is to blame, which would be encouraging because at least there'd be yeah. a reason for his regression and not just, oh, he had, you know, a fluke season in 2020 and maybe this is closer to who he is. Um, that being said, you know, he he is another, the Dodgers are short on left-handed pitchers uh, out of the bullpen. There hasn't really been uh, a real shutdown guy that they've been able to rely on. Maybe that ends up being Danny Duffy, but he's probably not, and I know we'll get into that, he's probably not coming yeah. until September anyway either. Um so, yeah, I mean, it, the past, it's more of what the season has basically been, just kind of trying to figure it out on the fly. What has changed this year, like you just alluded to, is you're chasing down the Giants, where in the past, the Dodgers have had a four, five, six, seven, seven game lead in the yeah. division. So if you lose a couple here and there, well, we're still up three games. We'll turn it around, or not turn it around. We'll flip the switch, if you will, in yeah. September and close this thing out. Uh, and that's not an option. Yeah, and it is interesting how... All of these injuries are basically impacting the same group, which is the pitching group. And you mentioned Gonzalez and Clevenger are two of your lefties. Nelson, another bullpen arm. Gonsolin, Kershaw. So you've got two starters, three relievers, all hurt. Again, that's not mentioning uh, Danny Duffy, who they traded for, who's a few weeks away. Cole Hamels, who we'll talk about in a moment. He's not due back until September. And so offensively, you know, we'll, we'll get to Turner and Mookie here in a moment, who are still technically healthy. Um but it's just fascinating. Scott Alexander is another guy who, like, it just feels like we haven't heard yeah, an update from point. him in a long time. Um, thankfully, Alex Vesia has been as good as he is because he's really the only left-handed option that you feel good. They brought in a guy yesterday that I won't even try and pronounce his name because I don't know much about him. Um, <laughs> he looked fine, by the way. So, like, shout out to him. Rule, <laughs> is that his name? Yeah, I believe that's the correct We'll just roll with it. We'll roll with it. I, I joke with people. I just If you say names with confidence, nobody's going to question you. So apologies if that's we're true. mispronouncing it. But th <laughs> thankfully, the Dodgers have been able to figure stuff out there. But man, it just feels like everything's coming to a head. Let's talk about the position players. Justin Turner and Mookie Betts are the other two. Uh, Turner removed from the game with groin tightness. Quote, I don't want to put a timetable on it. He'll be down for a few days. Then we'll sort of reevaluate. That was Dave Roberts' quote. That's not good. Now they have an off day today, which is, which is nice. But down for a few days, then we'll reevaluate groin tightness, not what you want in an older player like Turner. Then you got Mookie Betts with a hip injury. He was pulled from the game Friday um, with hip pointer. Thankfully, he was back in on Saturday, had a scheduled off day on Sunday, again off today. Um, quote, it doesn't really hurt me too much swinging. It's more running. So the hip def definitely does not play a part in the box. I've been able to find something and repeat it. So offensively, he says it's not an issue. 
defensively and on the base pass is where it's an issue. It's why they've tried to move him to second base, which isn't as much an option now that Trey Turner is in town. But, man, like if you want to just talk about pouring gasoline on what feels like becoming a dumpster fire, Turner groin tightness, Mookie Betts hip. And the Mookie Betts hip thing is like what you should do is rest it and he would be basically done for the rest of the season. They say he's not going to do any more damage to himself. It's just managing pain and sort of what he's able to actually accomplish out there. But, woof, Turner and Mookie, I mean – the hits just keep coming. Yeah, that's that's that was exactly my sentiment when uh, Turner came out of the game yesterday. And you know, like we've we've written some of the articles, he's been one of the few regulars who has avoided the injured list to this point. And obviously, I'm not saying he's going to end on end up on it yeah. this week. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Based on Dave Roberts' comments, I I wouldn't expect him in the lineup until Wednesday at the earliest. Uh, and then even then, you know, growings like with hamstrings can be tricky. You know, maybe he's back, but if he pulls it again or does something aggravate it, then you're definitely probably looking at some time on the IL. Uh, hopefully that won't be the case when it did take, uh, Dave Roberts did kind of have to, it seemed like he had to talk him into coming out of the game yeah. on Sunday. You know, they were having a conversation and dug out for a few minutes and you, we know, you know, Turner's <laughs> a competitor. He always wants to play and stay in there. Uh, and the Mookie situation, man, you know, for me, I put that in the same bucket as Kershaw where it's concerning, yeah. you know, it's, He's playing through it, and that's great, but you don't know. It could be, we saw it. It could be in the first inning where it just uh, gets inflamed and bothers him. It could be in the fourth or fifth inning. Maybe he makes it through an entire game. Uh, you know, there's a lot of unpredictability there, and my guess with him is you're going to probably see him play no more than three days in a row without an off day. The Dodgers try to rest their players yeah. anyway. And I think now, like, your hand is sort of forced with Mookie because you need to basically you know, manage him through the rest of August, September, and then into October, hopefully. And that's not going to be easy considering, you know, the, the details are, are scarce, but it seems like he's dealing with something pretty significant. I personally would not be surprised if he has some sort of surgery in the offseason. Yeah. And, and I, the, the stuff I've read is that this that it isn't what, the, if it's a hit pointer, like if it's kind of like if everybody's telling the truth, then it's not a situation where surgery is necessary. It's a just rest and stay off of it kind of scenario. Again, somebody, I think, described it almost like a bruise deep in your hip, maybe a bone bruise, that kind of thing. And so, but yeah, I mean, you just think about what the grind of the next 50 games is going to be like on top of what you hope to be an extended run into the postseason. I guess if there's one bit of good news is that the Dodgers probably have too many hitters for eight spots in the lineup right now. And so giving Justin Turner some days off, giving Mookie Betts some time off and not having to piss anybody off in the process is actually maybe a good thing. The flip side is, you want Mookie Betts in the lineup every day. You want Justin Turner in the lineup every day. There are other guys that you feel more comfortable about giving off days to. And so it's something to monitor. I mean, again, the Turner thing is worrisome. He'll be down a few days and then we'll reevaluate. That sounds to me like a potential injured list stint that comes at some point. Um, the Mookie hip thing, I think, is what it is. I think you just navigate it day by day. I don't see him going on the injured list. I think it's just like you said, play two days, take a day off, maybe play three days, take a day off, factor in off days that already just are built into the schedule and just hope for the best. But you you said it. I mean, it could be the first inning. He, he sprints out of the box, and it's like, hey, coach, I'm done. And then you're down a bench bat, which, I mean, for most teams might not be a big deal. We know what Dave Roberts likes to do in the times he's got caught <laughs> screwed with nobody on the bench. So um, we'll see. Let's end this segment with some slight good news. Gavin Lux on a rehab assignment and appears to be close to returning probably within the next week or so whenever he is needed. And then Corey Knable. Um, set to return on Tuesday. So Lux, less of a need, I would say, just given the depth that they have offensively. Um, but as long as like the Billy McKinney's of the world are on the roster, I would much rather have Gavin Lux. Zach McKinstry, I believe, had a home run yesterday uh, as well. I think he's on a rehab assignment too. So those two, positive. Corey Knable's the big one here. I mean, this is a guy that we're hoping will be in the back end of the bullpen, one of your three best relievers, basically, with Trinan and Jansen. So that's a big deal, I imagine, for the Dodgers to get Knievel back on Tuesday, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, you know, we saw a little bit of him earlier this season before his injury. He was pitching very well, and he was somebody, you know, a lot of fans started calling on for him to yeah. be the closer. Uh, and so I imagine if he pitches well again, there's going to be more of that. But at minimum, he'll take off, he'll take some of the pressure off Blake Trennan and Kenley Jansen. And like we just touched on with Jimmy Nelson being done for the year, Knievel's importance now is multiplied ten, you know, times yeah. 10 because he's now another uh, high leverage option for yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. 
And we mentioned Danny Duffy due back sometime in September. And the other guy that we'll talk about here in a second is Cole Hamels. Also not expected to be back until September. Hamels was signed uh, just this week. Uh, he was a free agent. He's a, um, a few weeks away from being there. He's a 37-year-old who's going to head to the minor leagues first. Um, I believe one of our posts pointed out he's got to be added to the roster by September 2nd in order to be eligible to play in the postseason. But um, Hamels pitched three and a third innings last year with Atlanta. Um, and then in 2019 was with the Cubs. I'll admit, I went back and looked at his numbers. I was surprised at how effective he was in 2018 and 2019. Now, he's 37 years old, and that's a few years ago. But 2019, he throws 141 innings pitched, 3.81 ERA, a FIP of 4.09, a strikeout per nine of over nine. So he's striking out more than a batter in innings. 2018, an ERA of 3.78. So, I mean, if, if you can get this guy and he can hover in the 4.00 ERA, I mean, I know that's a low bar and what we're talking about here, but if you can get 4.00 ERA from Cole Hamels down the stretch, you know, for five or six starts starting in September, we, des- we know the Dodgers need innings. And you said they're not going to add him to the roster until he can give them five. But, I mean, if you could get 4.00 ERA, I think that's a solid add. Yeah, I mean, he, like you said, he's basically going to be an innings eater. Uh, the only thing that surprised me with the signing is that he's basically he's not expected to be up with them until September, which, given the current state of their pitching, like, I thought he, uh, given Kershaw's injury when they signed Hamels, I thought, okay, like, this makes sense. Kershaw might be out a couple more weeks at least. It was before he offered, you know, a little more insight. Yeah. Uh, but then it came out that Hamels isn't really going to be ready until September either. Uh, so he's my guess is he's sort of an insurance policy. Maybe he takes uh, they're able to skip Urias in the rotation a couple times. Like you said, he's already far and away thrown the most innings of his career. So if you could take something off of him, that helps. Um, but yeah, I mean the the bar is going basically. They need a, a no disrespect to Cole Hamels. He was obviously a great pitcher in his time, but they need a warm body who could go out there and throw four or five innings and you know maybe not give up a ton of yeah, runs. Yeah, and I mean, and he's another one of these guys that I'm always bullish on. Hey, if you can get some quality at innings from him down the stretch, who knows? I mean, like, I, I wouldn't hate the idea of Cole Hamels becoming a relief pitcher in the postseason. He's a guy who's been there, yeah. a guy who has the track record, the pedigree, has pitched in the league. And so when you look around and say, okay, would you rather have Cole Hamels or, you know, I don't, I don't know who I would want to call out, but Cole Hamels or somebody else <laughs> in, like, the seventh inning of an NLDS game, like, who knows? Maybe you could get something out of him in the same way that David Price, Jimmy Nelson, Danny Duffy, those types – have been able to kind of reinvent themselves. Obviously, you're not talking about like a huge velocity uptick, I'm guessing, from 37-year-old Cole Hamels. I think he hovers in the low 90s on his good days, um, and that was two years ago. (laughs) So, But yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I think it's insurance that if Gonsolin doesn't come back, then you've got him as a fifth starter. Obviously, David Price is a little bit more flexible. He's been okay. I mean, his last start was really good. I think I saw a stat from Price's last start. He threw first pitch strikes to 16 out of 18 batters that he faced. And so Price has been giving you, if, if Hamels can just replicate what David Price has been giving them, which is yeah. getting into the sixth inning occasionally with two to three earned runs, I think you're thrilled with it. And you just take that as an upgrade over the bullpen games that we've been seeing. So a lot of injury news there. A lot of guys coming and going. Again, Danny Duffy, who we haven't even mentioned um, a ton about, but another acquisition, one of the better bullpen arms that the Dodgers are hoping to have in the postseason is still weeks away from being back um, from his injury as well. So that's the injury update. Let's shift gears a little bit and go to a segment that we do each week, which is stock up and stock down. We pick three players-ish from the Dodger roster of guys that over the last week, two weeks, three weeks, however long, that are either trending in the right direction, trending up, or trending down. Um, I believe we're going all positive today, which is good news. We could go stock (laughs) down with all of the injuries, but we just covered that at length. So Matt, I'll let you go first. Stock up for you. Who's the first guy that you've got on your list? All right. So first one I'm going to start off with is AJ Pollock. And, you know, if it, if Joey Votto didn't have a ridiculous stretch of home runs, Pollock was going to be, you know, probably the National League Player of the Month for yeah. July. Uh, and he's just con- carried that, you know, into August. He did have a brutal pinch hit appearance the other night, which ended his on-base and hitting streaks. Tough spot for him to be in, but uh, he picked right back up on Sunday. Three more hits, a couple RBIs, and you know he's just he's he's it's the Dodgers have needed every bit of it with you know Cody Bellinger kind of dealing with his struggles. Uh, Mookie Betts obviously spent some time on the injured list, and now with some uncertainty with his hips. So 
Really can't say enough about the job Pollock's been yeah, doing. Yeah, I, I looked it up over the last 14 days. He's hitting 465, an on base percentage of 478, and a slug of 651. That's over a two week stretch. And that was, you know, you could go back a month and it's probably the same, if not better. He had that stretch where he had like the most home runs to start the month of July or whatever it was. So he's yeah. been on a tear. And again, when you talk about injuries to Turner and Betts, Pollock is the type of guy that makes you feel okay saying, all right, if Mookie needs a rest day and we slide Chris Taylor, we put AJ Pollock here, whatever you know, you feel a little bit better about it. So I'll go with my first stock up. It's a guy I just mentioned. It's Mookie Betts. As good as A.J. Pollock has been, Mookie Betts has arguably been better. He's missed a bunch of time, but over the last 10 games he's played, he's got a 526 batting average, a 578 on base, and a 1.105 slugging percentage. 10 games, six home runs. Um, That's what's so fascinating is while he is hurt, while he is hobbled, offensively, I think I saw he raised his OPS 100 points in the last month, from 799 to 899. So whatever's going on with his hip, offensively, Mookie Betts has been fantastic. So he gets stuck up from me. Uh, any thoughts on Mookie or your next stock up? No, I'll just go on to my next one. Uh, I want to highlight Alex Vasilla. I know you brought him up earlier. Um, he's really turned his season around, and what was funny about it is his struggles earlier this year weren't a bunch of hits or a bunch of runs. It was just he was walking too many guys. And that would lead to, you know, two runs here, two runs there. Uh, he's been up and down a few times, but he's gotten everything sorted out now. Um, he's pitching well, and it's been needed. Um, and Dave Roberts, you know, said to his credit, this he has earned him. He's basically pitched himself into kind of a high leverage role moving yeah. forward. Yeah, and I mean, I, I get biased when guys come on our show and I get to chat with them. <laughs> Vasia is one of those. I mean, just a great story. Great energy. Love chatting with him. So I'm biased. I've always been pro. I was trying to find the stat. I think... Um, there was a number that Alex Vesia has thrown the second most unhittable pitches in all of baseball this season or something like that. Solid. I think Craig Kimbrell is number one and Alex Vesia is two. Mm-hmm. And Alex Vesia has thrown like half as many pitches, way less than half probably, than Craig Kimbrell. So I don't get it. Like, it's not like he's throwing 102. It's not like he has like the Devin Williams, whatever pitch he's throwing. Uh, he just throws fastballs at the top of the zone and guys can't hit it. So shout out to him. He's been great. Um, I'll stick with the bullpen. Uh, Phil Bickford gets stuck up for me. If you're a fan of the show, you know that I'm a big fan of Phil Bickford. Um, I loved this quote about Dave Roberts when asked about him. He said, quote, I knew nothing about him. He's been one of the biggest joys of the season. He's been a Dodger fan. He's very grateful. He's a hard worker. He's got that edge. He's a sweetheart of a guy, but when he takes the baseball, he's a savage. Guys love him. He's one of those guys I don't know where we would be without him. His last six appearances, one and a half ERA, eight strikeouts. Um, I saw a chart this week that kind of explains what has been so good. His fastball velocity is ticking up. Obviously, with all the sticky substances stuff going away, we've seen a lot of charts where they look the wrong way. They're going down. His velocity, at least, is trending up. He started the year under 93. Now he's up almost to 95 as the average fastball velocity for his four-seamer. So he's been fantastic. And again, we talk about all these injuries. Vessie and Bickford are two guys that when they come out of the bullpen, um, you just kind of trust him. Joe Kelly, another guy we haven't mentioned who kind of belongs in that conversation, but the fact that the Dodgers have been able to weather the storms that they have and still feel like you've got five or six guys out there that you kind of trust, and Bickford and Vessia being two of those, um, stock up for Phil Bickford for me. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Dave Roberts hit the nail on the head. I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't know much about him either, uh, but where the Dodgers would be, I mean, they're definitely not in the position yeah. they're in right now. They might be you know, closer to third place in the division than, than they are right now. Um, can't say enough about him. And, you know, I think also he's he's another example of kind of the player yep. development and coaching aspect, if you will, of the Dodgers have this track record of getting guys and being able to make a few changes, maybe with their delivery or just pitch selection. And they see, you know, an uptick in performance or velocity. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because that's what I was going to say. People can say what they want about the Dodgers salary cap. And, and look, the Dodgers salary is through the roof and whatever. But the thing that nobody ever wants to acknowledge is the fact that every team in baseball could have had Phil Bickford and the Dodgers got him and he's been fantastic. I I saw a guy who's a Rockies writer. He's like, why the heck are the Rockies not signing the Phil Bickfords of the world? You know, like he has a pedigree. I think he might have been a first round pick. Obviously, he's a local kid to L.A., but like he had the pedigree. If you're a crappy team, you should just be signing all of the Phil Bickfords of the world that hit it and say, let's see what we can do. Now, is it did the Dodgers tweak something? Is it something to you that only the Dodgers could have unlocked? It's very possible, but these are the types of things that I think Andrew Friedman doesn't get enough credit for. We talk about the the under-the-radar guys that he just sort of plucks off of 
you know, the waiver wire, literally the waiver wire, or guys that he just gets thrown in. You know, if Fessia can continue what he's doing, you know, yes, the Dylan Floro piece hurts, but if you can get seven years of Vessia in exchange for two or three years of Floro, then all of a sudden things start to look good. So I, I just want to give a shout out because I do think those types of moves that kind of float under the radar are worth going. So, okay, last stock up or stock down for you. All right, last one, uh, stock going stock up again, it's going to be Trey Turner. Um, we talked about it kind of earlier on the show. You know, some of it was kind of an awe factor and seeing him now uh, up close, and it's only been two games, three if you count his pinch hit appearance. But I don't know, like, and it may sound funny to include him in here, but the reason I do is, like we've touched on, with some of the uncertainty with Mookie, Trey Turner coming and providing uh, the a lot of the same skill sets from the leadoff spot that Mookie does, taking that pressure off of him, is basically needed at this point. Like, it's not yeah. really a luxury. You know, at, at the time of the trade, maybe you think it's a luxury. Oh, they got Max Scherzer and Trey Turner. But now looking at the landscape of the roster, it, he's a necessity. And I was surprised uh, to see Mookie drop down to third in the lineup. I thought maybe he'd be yeah. second which we saw that last year and he didn't do well. So I guess, you know, maybe for whatever reason, he's more comfortable. <laughs> he needs odd, third. odd numbers it's looked, in the lineup, maybe. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's looked that way so far. Um, but yeah, you know, putting Trey Turner at the top has is, is been, I think he's he's already exceeded, you know, what were probably pretty lofty expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Abs- and, and just, again, to know, like, I the rental thing always freaks me out, to know that he is here for an entire another year is such a beautiful feeling. <laughs> to know, because it's like, hey, look, if we do end up in the wild card and you gave up all this for Max Scherzer, that would be tough. That would be a tough pill to swallow if he did not resign. The flip side is, if you know that you have a year and a half of Trey Turner and he plays at the level he's playing at, I think you can justify the trade, even if that was all all that you gave up. So for mine, I'm going to give a shout out to two people real quick. Walker Bueller, ERA of 0.95 in his last three starts, 19 innings pitched. He's been fantastic. And then Chris Taylor, last 23 games, seven home runs, leads a team, leads a team in runs scored, 19, added 17 RBIs and three steals. So both those guys have just, those are like the steady, right? That's like the Muncy, Taylor, Bueller. Those are the guys where it's just like, you've just been able to pencil it in all year. I don't believe in jinxes. I don't believe in knock on wood. If I did, I would do it. But those are the guys that you've been penciling in. So, so good one there. Let me ask one question while we stay in this segment. I think a guy that sort of could have been penciled into the stock down category for the last few weeks is Cody Bellinger. And asked about, uh, whether or not Bellinger was going to be a platoon player with Chris Taylor. Dave Roberts basically said he's going to be in there against righties for now. So that's a, that, that seems like a yes to the, is Cody Bellinger in a platoon moment right now? The, ER, the, the average still well below 200. He is on a six-game hitting streak. Five of those have been one hit, though. So it's like a, a, you know one for four or five games in a row is what it is. He does have back-to-back games with a home run. Um, he's seven for 22 over that stretch. Only three strikeouts has yet to walk. Where are you at on Bellinger? Because I, I joked with Daniel on Twitter the other night, Bellinger hits the home run, and it's like, you know, we get excited. And I'm like, the guy hits a home run like once every 10 days, and everyone thinks this is the moment he turns it around, and then he throws an 0 for 12. He did come back with another home run. But again, 2 for 8, 2 home runs. You could frame those two games however you wanted to. You've been watching a lot more closely than me, especially this past week. What do you see? Are you seeing good at bats? Are you seeing discipline? Or are you seeing a guy who swings the crap out of the bat and like sometimes he hits the ball? I think the discipline is still there for the most part. Uh, what seems to be his biggest issue is he honestly is just mini- missing pitches yeah. in the zone. A hanging curveball that last year, three years ago, he would have you know sent halfway up the pavilion. He's now fouling yeah. off. Uh, a fastball you know, not necessarily elevated out of the zone, but high that he's shown before that he can handle. He's either swinging through or fouling it off. Um, and that, you know, I know when we did, uh, I think it was our trade deadline recap with Justin on here. I said, I thought it was a little bit more mental. I, I guess, you know, I don't, maybe that was getting ahead of myself a little bit. You know, it's kind of what came first, the chicken yeah. or the egg type thing. Uh, I think both physical in terms of his swing mechanics is a factor. Like, I don't, there's no denying that. Whether you want to say it's his actual batting stance or the actual swing, obviously, but above my kind of uh, <laughs> yeah. knowledge and ability to break all that down. Um, but I think he's also pressing. Yeah. He's somebody who is, is used to, you know, he's won, he's won an MVP award. He's been in big moments for the Dodgers. He's used to being kind of that guy. And he hasn't been. And I think the time that he's missed because of injuries has obviously been a factor. Um, but 
So for me, I mean, you know, it, it kind of it, it is what it is. You know, you I'm not expecting much from him. The good thing is the Dodgers don't necessarily need a yeah. whole lot because of when the big if if yeah. healthy, he's the eighth hitter. He can be he can be your eighth hitter, and that's fine for now. You know, play good defense. Um, in terms of his role, you know, I know Dave Roberts did basically allude to him being a platoon, but I think even that, you know, we're going to see a lot of that will depend on yeah. Mookie because if Mookie is unable, you know, if he deals, if he needs to miss two games in a row because of his hip, well, Cody's going to be in there starting no matter yeah. what. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Again, full disclosure, I didn't get to watch closely many of the games this past week because I was gone. I watched Saturday, and you have these moments where it's like, he is such a mess. Like, it's like you said, he's swinging through pitches in the zone. It's like he just can't catch up to 95-mile-an-hour fastballs. He's swinging at pitches that aren't close. He's popping the ball up in moments. And then there's then he hits the home run, right? And it's such a – I don't know what to do with it. There was a moment on – I think it was uh, – it must have been – maybe it was Saturday. But um, I'm, I can't remember who was up. I, I, maybe it was Muncie. But it was sort of like they had shifted everybody. Maybe it was Seager. I think it was, it was definitely Seager. That's what it was. Trey Turner was on first base. Corey Seager comes up. They have the whole infield shifted away, so only one guy between second base and third base. And Corey Seager gets a fastball and definitely looked clear that all he was trying to do was just slap it into left field, which he effectively did. He puts it on a line. There's only one guy over there. He hits it hard enough. The guy had no chance. Easy single. Those are the, I, I watched it, and I was like, why can't Bellinger do that? Like, It feels like every time he swings, he's trying to hit a home run. And yes, he does it once out of every four times for the last two games, but the other three are just seem to me like non-competitive at bats, failed opportunities to move guys over, failed opportunities to put the ball in play in a meaningful way. And so I don't know. I mean, I'm still, I know it's in there. Like, I don't think the MVP was his total fluke and he's just a terrible player, but I just, I, I, I struggle to find reasons for optimism over the next few weeks that he's going to be able to turn it around, that at some point this is just going to click because it just feels like this is more than a slump. It feels like something more is going on, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, probably a combination of both. I don't know. Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment, do you think? I think that's fair. I think another thing also that we need to keep in mind is his shoulder exactly. surgery. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't sound like he's fully recovered from that. And I think that could be one reason why maybe he's not able to go, you know, the other way with any sort of consistency, the way Seager yeah. uh, did in that uh, scenario you presented. I don't, so, you know, I think basically what you're going to have to hope for is, you know, he's, he's still Cody Ballinger. He still has those home runs in him. He still can play really good defense when he's out in the field. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe something to consider too. I know bunting is no, totally. taboo and, but hey, you know, if you get into the postseason and Cody Bellinger's batting and you you need a runner moved and they've shifted him, he's not getting on base very yeah. often anyway. Like just take the in my opinion, try to just push a bunt up the third base line and if you get on, great, like we keep the line moving yeah. kind of thing. Uh I know we might we might get a couple nasty comments for that because bunting is bad in baseball, but you know, it yeah. you take that over. He should abso- he should right? absolutely the, the rate at which he is getting on base, when you're hitting 170, you should have no shame in if there is one guy on the third base side of the field, you should have no shame in just being able to lay down a bunt. Because A, you're going to get on base a couple times, and B, at some point they might stop shifting you and it's going to open up the right side of the infield exactly what you need. But if this is, I think, yeah, I think this is the biggest storyline that the Dodgers have going for the next 50 games. Because right now, A.J. Pollock was the second best player in the National League for the last month. Chris Taylor was probably the second or third best offensive player the Dodgers have had for the last month, you could argue, the entire season. And Mookie Betts is Mookie Betts. He raises OPS by 100 points. Trey Turner's playing second base. Corey Seager's playing shortstop. Justin Turner's playing third. Max Muncy's playing first. Cody Bellinger is the odd man out right now. Like, if we got into a must-win game, Cody Bellinger is the odd man out. And that's a huge storyline. And, and I'll be fascinated to see, obviously, if he turns it around, he can make Dave Roberts' life more difficult in having to make some of those decisions. But I don't know how – I mean, he's like – his batting average is 100 points lower than any of the guys that we just mentioned. And, again, from my perspective, the at-bat quality hasn't looked a whole lot different. He, he looks like he's swinging the bat like a guy who's hitting about 200. So we'll move on from Bellinger. We've got 10 minutes left. We'll throw some – we'll do some weekend quotes because there's some good ones in here. Um, I mentioned we get back to the Astros series. Let's do that now. Um, Mookie Betts said on Wednesday, this is probably one of the best atmospheres I've ever played in. It was amazing to be a part of. Definitely we'll put that in the memory bank. 
You, I believe, were at both of those games Tuesday and Wednesday. I'd love to hear your perspective as a guy who's who's been at Dodger Stadium more times than Mookie Betts has with the full capacity. Um, <laughs> but where did that rank for you? And, and describe the scene for those of us that weren't in the building. Oh, man. Yeah, it's it's at the top of, you know, the craziest atmosphere I've ever covered for at Dodger State. I, I mean, really anywhere. It And that includes... You know, it had it, that includes a World Series, and it had a similar feel of in terms of anticipation as I felt when being there for a postseason or World Series yeah. game. What was different was like the anger and hostility, yeah. like genuine uh, hate that the fans that the fans had. And uh, the easiest way to really sum that up is, you know, we're sitting in the press box during batting practice. The Astros players are hitting home runs like every team does. Fans were throwing the batting practice home run balls back onto the field. Never seen that, ever. Yeah. Like, I've never seen it. Other veteran reporters who've been doing this longer than I have saying the same thing. They've never seen anything like that. And so that kind of set the tone for what ended up coming was just, you know, relentless booing, <laughs> especially for, you know, Jose Altuve and Carlos Correa. And it was honestly crazy. And so that was Tuesday. Wednesday was a little bit more tame. Maybe losing Tuesday night had something to do with it. Tuesday was also the first time fans could kind of get it off yeah. their chest, and so they were probably just going to be more, you know, uh, voiceful with it. There still were boos Wednesday, but also, <clears throat> and maybe Max Scherzer making his Dodgers yeah, debut. Yeah, a little positivity, a little to positivity that. to mix in with the negativity. Right. So, you know, there were still the boos for Correa, but then, you know, Scherzer struck him out, uh, or not Correa, Scherzer struck out Altuve three times. And then Joe Kelly got in for a fourth time. And so, you know, Dodge Stadium obviously loved that. Um, but it was crazy. I mean, I, I, I don't, like, I, I can't, it's hard for me to really put into words other than just saying, like, it, I've never seen anything like that. The, there was some speculation when reading the post-game quotes, um, folks wondering whether the animosity, the vitriol that was in the, the building, but also, I mean, amongst the team. Like, we know the Dodgers, they, they hate this group. Like, a lot of those guys, Turner, Bellinger, Seeger, Kelly, Jansen, I mean, the, the, a lot of those guys either lived it or have been a part of the rivalry since then. Do you think that contributed to the three to nothing loss and just the absolute dud? Like, was it an over, almost like getting too amped up for a game a day off or a day after an off day? Or do you think it was just, they just happened to crap the bed that day and it was purely coincidence? I think it was more coincidence because the Do- like the Dodgers have already they played the yeah. Astros already True. right since since everything came out um, times, I guess. and I felt yeah I felt their first matchup in after you know the whole investigation uh, went public and everything and you know they were the Dodgers were open with their criticism during spring training the first time they played them then was in Houston obviously no fans but I felt for those games the team was a little tight a little. You know, we really want to stick it to you guys. We want yeah. whatever payback we could possibly get in this one regular season game. I don't know if that was really a factor this time around. I, what I do think was a factor uh, were the inflatable trash cans going onto the field. Fans also throwing foul balls back onto the field. Because a lot of that was happening, you know, while Walker Buehler yeah. was pitching. And he pitched, he gave up some hits, but he pitched through traffic. You know, he only allowed, I think it was just the one run. Um I think that might have had more of an impact than, you know, maybe any sort of emotional hangover. And, you know, Lance McCullers, he pitched yeah. well. And and also, frankly, the Dodgers didn't have their best line. Like, if you if they were playing the Astros this past weekend with Trey Turner available, I think you're looking at a very different uh, outcome fair, that night. Fair. Okay, the next, the next quote here is in relation to the statistic that every Dodger fan is sick of hearing and yet can't get out of their mind. The Dodgers are 1-12 in, in extra inning games this year. Um, I think it was our diet in the, at the athletic who, who had like, this isn't, it's like the third worst win percentage in extra innings of all time. But the problem, the difference is those other two teams were like 40 games under 500. Like they were just terrible teams that lost most games anyways. So for the Dodgers to be 20 games over, to be winning 60% of their games period, and to be one in 12 in extras, right? Even if you take those 13 games off in regulation, like nine inning games, the Dodgers are winning, I don't know, probably 65 to 70% of their games. And yet in extra innings, they're winning like 7%, 8% of their game. So Robert, here was the quote. There's no explanation. This is against the, after the Angels lost. Tonight, Iglesias lined a ball down the line, drove him in. Max had a tough play going back on the ball and didn't come up with it. That was their second run. We tacked on a run and couldn't put another one on the board. That's kind of how this one played out, which I know you know. I don't have an explanation for 1-12. We've talked about this. 
I don't know if you and I personally have talked about this. Daniel and I have. Is this just bad luck? Is this the Dodgers' inability to hit situationally? Is it just poor timing? I mean, Ardaya, again, went through it. Like, the Dodgers have been good in close situations. The bullpen has been good in high-pressure situations. 1-12 in 12 in extra innings, though. I mean, when you're four games back in a division, if, if you're 5-8 and eight in extra inning games, you're tied for the division. They're 1-12, and 12, they're four yeah. games back. Yeah, I, yeah. It's I think really it's just been sort of a perfect storm of everything. And like Dave Roberts has has said before, after other uh, losses and extra innings, is it like as much as maybe there have been some similarities, each one has sort of been unique in its own way. And like he said for this Angels one, you know, Max Muncie that was going to be a tough play, but he almost made the play. And if he does, then it's only you know that additional run doesn't score, and maybe that makes a difference for the Dodgers when, I mean, it, it would have made yeah. a difference, right? Cause they did come back and get one. Um, I, it, it, I mean, without like going back and looking at each loss in extra innings, I mean, the only thing, cause if you, if you look at their stats for the entire season in terms of situational hitting, they rank in the top yeah. 10 in most categories with, you know, runners in scoring position, runners in scoring position with two outs, but it's just something about getting the free runner in extra innings on second base that they just struggle with. I don't know if maybe, obviously, if you go into extra innings, you've probably played a pretty close game through the first nine. And so the Dodgers have, you know, sort of used their high leverage yeah. relievers in those situations. And like we touched on earlier, the injuries, uh, the inconsistency with some with performance was from some of the guys. So then you get into the 10th, 11th inning and you're using, you know, relievers who just in general have kind of been have had their struggles. And it's just kind of, you know, wrong spot at the wrong yeah. time. Um, the other night against, well, no, I guess it wasn't extra innings because it was the Astros. I was going to bring up Jimmy Nelson's injury, but irrelevant. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, I, it's, it What's fascinating know. is like, that, like, you would think that depth has always been a strength of the Dodgers. You would think that, like you said, so if both teams have played a close game, they've probably used high-leverage guys in the 7th, 8th, and ninth. I'm programmed to believe that when we get to our 5th, 6th, and 7th best relief pitchers, that the Dodgers should be better prepared than the Angels that the Dodgers should be better prepared than the Rockies, whoever it is they're playing. And yet, for whatever reason, it hasn't played out like that. Now, I, you could say, hey, maybe all the bullpen games have stacked up, and that's why. But the flip side is, like, some of these losses were before the Dodgers, when the Dodgers had a healthy starting pitching staff. So you can't tack it all. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, I do think there's an element of situational baseball that the Dodgers have not been good at because they're just so committed to doing their thing. Um but that's not to say other teams are better at it than them. So I, I don't know. So last one here, and then we'll be done. The lineup order. This has been a topic of conversation. Dave Roberts was asked. I think there's really no way to put it together that doesn't look right. I think for me, both guys, this being Trey and Mookie, felt being in a certain part of the order with consistency was important to them. Trey's hit a lot at the top of the order and be able to utilize his speed at the top to create havoc on the bases. Stress, I feel really good about that. To supplant Muncie in the two behind him, get on base, drive runs in. I feel really good about that. And then Mookie in there versus right or left in the three to get on base, drive runs in. I feel good. That was kind of the impetus. For the most part, that's where you'll see those three guys. If you look at the order, that's exactly, you know, we, we Daniel and I debated after the trade, or maybe we talked about who would we have as a starter, uh, as a leadoff guy. Turner has batted first in both of his games. Muncie has batted second in both of his games. And then I think is where, you know, I guess you could put the first three. It'll be Turner, Muncie, bets when all those guys are in. Pollock took his place on Sunday. Then it feels like you've got Turner and Seager who will be flip flop. They were it was Seager Turner on Saturday, uh, and then Turner Seager on Sunday, and then the six seven eight hole is Smith Taylor Bellinger Smith and Taylor on Saturday Taylor and Smith on Sunday. So again, I love Dave Roberts' quote. Like, there's no way to put this lineup card together that doesn't look good. I've watched two games. I think Trey Turner has to be the leadoff guy. It seems clear that Muncy's going to be the number two guy. Mookie when he's in there is three. Seager and Turner fourth and fifth. Smith and Taylor, 6th and 7th, and then Bellinger, 8th. How do you feel about the way that... Because one thing that's interesting is if Pollock takes Bellinger's spot, it feels like a mistake to have Pollock batting 8th, but I don't know who you move him ahead of. I mean, Smith maybe batting 8th or Taylor batting 8th. You can't really go wrong with this group. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess for me, it starts off at being a little surprised uh, that Trey Turner was put into the leadoff spot, only because, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Mookie very clearly appears yeah. most comfortable there. So far, you know, in the brief time he spent batting third, he's looked fine. So that that's great, obviously, for the Dodgers. Um, I also wasn't convinced that they would drop Seager down that low. I thought maybe Muncie would end up being 
who gets dropped down. Um, but yeah, I mean, like Dave Roberts said, there's no real wrong yeah. way. I think I, I do like the idea of Trey Turner, Max Muncy, Mookie Betts batting first, second, third. From there, if you have Justin Turner, Corey Seager, fourth or fifth, there that's interchangeable yeah. to me. Um, and then, I mean, really, same thing. Like you said, it, it all depends on what happens with the Cody Ballinger, AJ Pollock dynamic. Um, Will Smith maybe is a good six hitter. I don't know if I'd move him much lower than yeah. that, but and then Pollock's seventh. I it's mean, so I, funny because you, you know, can get mad about how low a guy is hitting in the order, and then it's like, okay, tell me who you would like to move. Like, who, who is that person leapfrogging? Right. You know, it's like, I can't believe Will Smith batted seventh on Sunday. It's like, okay, do you want him ahead of Taylor? Do you want him ahead of Seager, Justin Turner, AJ Pollock? It's like, no, 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 no. Okay, well, I guess he's a seventh hitter, you know? So it's just so fascinating, and it, it's a good problem to have. Again, Gavin Lux. Mac, uh, Zach McKinstry, Albert Pujols, when all those guys, Pujols obviously healthy, Lux and McKinstry not. Um, the offense is the least of the concerns on paper. Now, they haven't produced. You lose yeah. three to nothing to the Astros. I'm not going to sit here and say that the offense is killing it. They have been one of the better offenses in baseball. But the offense is going to need to take it up a notch even further, given the state of the bullpen, given the state of starting pitching. And you look at that. It, it's an all-star team. I mean, I mean, that is not hyperbole. Like, Will Smith is the second or third best catcher, second best catcher in the whole National League, and he's batting seventh or eighth. Chris Taylor's an all-star. Corey Seager, MVP from last year, World Series. Justin Turner, no, no, you know, A.J. Pollock, Player of the Month. Muncie, all-star. Trey Turner, one of the best players in baseball. Mookie Betts, one of the best players in baseball. Cody Bellinger, former MVP. Literally an all-star roster. In some ways, that might be better than some all-star lineups we've seen in years past, uh, if we're yeah. being serious here. So, Anyways, good problem for the Dodgers and Dave Roberts to have. Well, that'll do it. We've got the Phillies and the Mets due up this week. Daniel and I will be back with a live show at some point this week. And then I'm gone again Monday through Friday of next week. We'll see about, we might be able to record a Dodger heads before I leave. And then I'm back. Then I'm here for the stretch run. I'm rested up, ready to go. So Matt, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jeff Spiegel. Check out Dodger Blue 1958 on social media, dodgerblue.com for all the latest updates. And please, please, please spread the word. Subscribe to our channel. Ring the notification bell as well below. We appreciate you. We'll end our show the way we always do, with the beautiful voice of Vince Scully. The best team holding a trophy high in the air. The Los Angeles Dodgers, champions of the baseball world.